And a special good morning, too, to those joining us on the World Wide Web. And I fiddle around in the bottom of the lectern for my I, iPad or whatever. How many of you are old enough to remember the days when we, we, we asked riddles of each other? You remember riddles? We used to say, riddle me this, riddle me that. Guess me this riddle, our prop snatch. And for those who don't speak Jamaican, that is, guess me this riddle. Or perhaps you might not. But it's much nicer when we say it in the vernacular. Let's say it together. Riddle me this. Riddle me this. Riddle me that. Riddle me that. Guess me this riddle. Guess me this riddle. And perhaps not. And perhaps not. And then would come the riddle. What's black and white and red all over? The newspaper. Yes, me teacher, me teacher. And my favorite, send why go call doctor, doctor come before why. Anybody remember? The coconut, because the boy would go up the tree and the coconuts would drop before he could come down. So I've titled my encouragement today, Solving the Prosperity Riddle. And you notice I'm wearing money in my pocket. So, a lawyer and a Jamaican are uh, sitting next to each other on a long flight. This was inspired by uh, Norman Wright, my favorite, my favorite QC. The lawyer can't sleep on aircraft. He must be on the Fund Development Committee for the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living, dreaming up ingenious ways of um, supporting this ministry. So he can't, he can't sleep. And the Jamaican, having parted all night, the night before, wants to catch up on his snoozing. So he settles down for a nap. But the lawyer says, would you like to play a game? Remember when we used to have riddles? The Jamaican declines, but the lawyer persists, explaining that the game is a lot of fun. He said, look here, look here, I'll tell you what. I'm going to ask you a question, and if you don't know the answer, you pay me only $5. Then you ask me a question, and if I don't know the answer, I'll pay you $500. Dollars. Boy, yes, naturally this catches the Jamaican's attention. He remembers the days back in the village where he grew up when that was a popular pastime, asking riddles and telling Anansi stories. And so, in any event, you know, he, he needs to improve his financial situation. And the riddle of how to do this and to improve his cash flow has been puzzling him for a long time. So since he's in need of a financial bailout, he agrees to play the game. The lawyer asks the first question. Uh, uh, tell me, what is the distance from Earth to the moon? Without a word, the Jamaican reaches into his pocket, pulls out a $5 bill, and hands it to his fellow traveler. Now it's the Jamaican's turn. Riddle me this and riddle me that. Guess me this riddle, and perhaps not. What goes up a hill with three legs and comes down with four? The lawyer uses his iPad, searches all the references he knows. He searches the net and even the Library of Congress. He sends emails to all the smart friends who he, he had at, at college and when he was called to the bar, to no avail. And after an hour of searching, he finally gives up. So he wakes up this Jamaican fellow traveler and says, hey, hey, see your $500 here? The Jamaican pockets the $500 and goes back to sleep. The lawyer can't stand it, he's going nuts. He has to know the answer. So he wakes up the Jamaican, he said, hey bro, you can't let sleep away and leave me like this. What goes up a hill with three legs and comes down with four? The Jamaican reaches into his pocket and hands his fellow traveler $5. <laughs> and then goes back to sleep. <laughs> riddle me this, riddle me that. Guess me this riddle, and perhaps not. You see, financial experts the world over have been trying to, to figure out this riddle 
of the world finances and have predicted prolonged scarcity, lack, ruin, and recession for years. Here in Jamaica, many of us worry about the value of the Jamaican dollar and the upward spiral of the cost of living. But my friends, worry about inflation and the high cost of living is not a modern scourge. Over two and a half millennia ago, the prophet Haggai wrote, and I quote, he who earns wages, earns wages to put them into a bag with holes, unquote. Do you feel like that when you go to the supermarket sometimes, like you put your money in a bag with holes? I've had a whole raft of folks coming for counseling from time to time, all with stories about their own challenges in the area of prosperity. How do we solve the prosperity riddle? They feel as though their money is in a bag with holes. And so I believe it is time for those of us who practice the science of mind to respond to the times by using the powerful tools we have at our disposal. You'll notice that our program for October focuses on the idea of prosperity. And I want you to think about this, this topic in your own life and your own business and your own affairs all of this month. In addition, on Thursday evenings from 7 to 9 p.m., we are learning how to utilize the prospering power of love to solve the financial riddle of the times. This is not a quick, a get quick um, course, a get rich quick course, but rather a spiritual exercise designed to teach you how to use the power of love inherent in you to achieve a sense of spiritual well-being, which by the way, is the original meaning of the word wealth. And while we are on the original meaning of words, did you know that the word prosperity comes from a Latin root which means to go forward with hope? When you say, I am prosperous, what you are decreeing is that, is that you are moving forward through your life, certain of your source and your substance. So prosperity really is an attitude toward life, a consciousness of being a fully functioning person in an already abundant universe, experiencing what the beautiful Jesus called the life more abundant. Eric Butterworth, who authored a book titled Spiritual Economics, which I wish our financial pundits would read and digest, had this to say about prosperity, and I quote, the starting point of realizing prosperity is to accept responsibility for your own thoughts, thus taking charge of your life. You are not responsible for what is said in the Wall Street Journal or what comes out of Washington in the form of economic indicators, but you are very much responsible for what you think about these things. You cannot afford to let the so-called experts decide how you are going to think and feel. For how you think and feel about the economy in general and your financial affairs in particular will unvaryingly determine what you experience." Unquote. And as we know, the Master said, it is done unto you as you believe. It is for this reason that we need to refrain from referring to the economy as declining and to avoid conversations about the high cost of living. Instead, form the habit of thinking and talking about the things you want to see more of in your life. I was standing beside a lady in the supermarket and she said to me, you see how you take there? I said, pick them up there and bless them if you want them and if you don't want them, leave them and bless them still. She said, you know, that's a good idea. I noticed that you do it, you know, you, you walk around and you, you, you I thought you were just talking to yourself, but you, and, 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 you're not, your head don't take you. You're blessing the things on the shelf, I said, every item. <laughs> Butterworth recommends that we give ourselves occasional consciousness boosters. Try it when you go to the supermarket. Such as, and I quote, God is my instant, constant, and abundant source of supply. Let us say that together. God is my instant, constant, and abundant source of supply. I'm not convinced. Let me hear you. God is my instant, constant, 
and abundant source of supply. I also like the title of Practitioner Courtney Johnson's treatment on page two of your program. Let's affirm it. I am here to manifest prosperity. Together? I am here to manifest prosperity. Remember that this morning that you are here to manifest prosperity as Norman Wright and his team um, interact with you after the service. Let us say we are here to manifest prosperity. We are here to manifest prosperity. Friends, we are here to do just that personally and as a spiritual community to circulate that prosperity so that it benefits our country. Today's fun activity by our fund development ministry, for example, is, is an example of how you expand your, your prosperity consciousness. Because what we are really doing is more than simply raising funds to refurbish a kitchen. What we are doing is powerfully symbolic of the role our church is playing in offering spiritual food to people who hunger and thirst after righteousness. And so today, as you participate and contribute, know that you are making a meaningful contribution, not to the kitchen of the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living only, but to the spread of truth and to the feeding of people who are in desperate need of knowing how to solve the riddle of their personal finances and prosperity. I mentioned earlier that I have been seeing a lot of people who are challenged in this area. And one of the questions I frequently ask them, and I've asked it before from this podium, and I want to ask it again, it is this. What are you worth? What are you worth? Have you ever thought about that? Not your worth in terms of what assets you have, in terms of how much money in the bank, but what is your worth as a valid, valuable, and authentic representative of God on earth? And you know, many people say, boy, I never thought of that, you know. What am I worth? You mean in money terms? I say, yes, give me a figure. What are you worth? If you had to put a figure on yourself, what would you put? One person said to me, I'm worth a lot, I know that, but I only earn. You know what the Jamaican word for only is? Ongle. O-N-G-L-E. Ongle. Me ongle have five dollars. Or, them ongle, ongle give, offer me an increase of three percent. And so I coined a few years ago the word ongleness. Ongleness is an insidious disease. It's even more virulent than chicken pneumonia, as it is called in some circles. The Old Testament story of the widow who went to the prophet Elisha in distress in 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 to 7, illustrates the principle of how ongliness can deprive you of what you already have. She had been left destitute by the death of her husband. You remember the story? So she was unable to pay her, her creditors. And under Talmudic law, she would have to forfeit her two beloved sons to work as slaves for the creditors until the debt was repaid. I can just hear her anguished cry to Elijah, help me please, my husband is dead and the creditors are coming to take my sons. Listen to what Elisha asked her. What have you in the house? That's what Elisha asked her. What do you have in the house? And here comes the ongliness. I have only a pot of oil. I have only one pot of oil. This response indicates that despite having a pot of oil, her consciousness was one of lack. You see, friends, the pot of oil was evidence of God's substance. But if you have a deep-seated belief in lack, you see even what you have as a symbol of po poverty rather than as evidence of God's abundance. How often do you get trapped in that ongle mentality? She only gave me so-and-so, or I only have so-and-so. So today I want you to look around your house and bless everything you have. It doesn't mean that you don't want to upgrade. 
and that you don't want nicer things and more of this or more of that, but bless what you have in the house. And you know what Elisha advised her to do? He said, go and borrow additional vessels from the neighbors. She did, and as she began to pour, it flowed freely, filling every pot she had. For you see, the vessels represent her broadened expectations. She expanded her idea of the possibilities, and the substance represented by the oil kept flowing. And that's how the universe works. When you have an expectation, the universe fills, moves to fulfill it. When there are no more vessels, the oil ceases flowing. And this is a wonderful lesson on the ability of the universe to supply all that we are able to conceive and also underscores the truth that God can only give you as much as you have a consciousness to receive. In her book, Lessons in Truth, Emily Cady puts it this way, quote, one of the unerring truths in the universe is that there is already provided a lavish abundance for every human want. Another truth is the demand must be made before the supply can come forth to fill it. The demand must be made before the supply can come forth, forth to fulfill it." Unquote. What Katie was underscoring is, we must provide the vessels in which the oil may be increased. There is no point asking the universe for abundance if you are tight-fisted, or as we say in Jamaica, pinchy Kobe, with a consciousness of ongleness. And you know, sometimes I get trapped in that too. I, I have $20,000 worth of bills to pay, and I have $20,000, and I say, but how am I going to tithe from that $20,000? It will only leave me 18. Uncle, leave me 18, and I have $20,000 worth of, of bills to pay. But you know how it works? When you give back to the source in recognition of its, of its allness and its fullness in your life, the 18,000 goes further, don't ask me how, than the 20,000 would have done. It happens over and over. Money comes from some unexpected source, and if you keep on tithing from it, you find that that also increases and multiplies. The oil begins to flow. And that is why, you know, Jesus couldn't have meant that we should petition or beg God. He said, ask, and it will be given. In Luke 1232, he says it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So it is obvious that he, asking in the sense that he uses it means that we should claim our entitlement by cultivating a consciousness of receptivity to our good. The answer to the prosperity riddle then lies in the consciousness of each one of you. You have to build an individual consciousness of the omnipresence of God's substance in your life, waiting on the unseen side of life to be molded into any and everything you desire by the power of your thoughts. Begin today to see yourself as a distributing center of God's good. A lot of people, when they are wanting to increase their prosperity, ask for greater inflow. And so they're thinking of just getting, getting, getting. You want to try breathing in and not exhaling? It's impossible. So you need to think of yourself as being in the flow, as being a circulating center for God's good, so that it flows to you, it flows through you, and it flows back out to bless, prosper, and enrich everyone whom it touches, and therefore replenishes your financial affairs. Whenever you handle money, friends, bless it. Don't get caught in the ongle trap. Bless what is passing in your hands. Whenever you hand money, whenever you're writing a check, whenever you receive money, bless it. It is God's substance in circulation through you. Throughout history, the spiritually enlightened have linked prosperity to righteousness. But you see, the admonition to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness was not referring to some ostentatious deity or, you know, the, the Pharisees made a big big act of, um, of celebrating God. Rather, it meant that you should cultivate the right use of divine law, right 
Righteousness means right useness of the law of cause and effect. Haggai's response to the problem of the economy in Haggai 1 verse 8 was to go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house. Metaphysically, going up to the hills means to seek the silence within, to rise up in consciousness where you get a renewed sense of God as your all-pervading source. The house represents your consciousness. So having built your consciousness, you can go about your affairs with faith in the unfailing availability to you of divine substance. It is inexhaustible, and it is yours for the claiming. So did you think I'd forgotten your assignment? You're lucky. Your assignment, should you decide to undertake it this week, is to ponder Elisha's question to the widow with regard to yourself. What do you have in your house? And remember, the house means the house of your consciousness. What are you giving your attention to day by day, moment by moment? What kinds of discussions are you having with other people about money and about the economy and about prosperity? And second part of your assignment is to praise and bless the wealth of God that is demonstrated in your life right here and right now. Answer the question, what am I worth? And jot down a figure, just as a fun thing. Give yourself, let, just let the zeros follow, you know, fill the page. Take into consideration your talents, your abilities, your training, your experience, your expertise, your capabilities, and come up with a figure that represents your worth. And after you write that figure down, under it write, I am God's living enterprise, and I am here to manifest prosperity. I am God's living enterprise, and I am here to manifest prosperity. Can we say that together? I am God's living enterprise, and I am here to manifest prosperity. To your neighbor say, you are God's living enterprise, and you are here to manifest prosperity. You are God's living enterprise, and you are here to manifest prosperity. You are God's living enterprise, and you are here to manifest prosperity. I said, your neighbor, not the whole church. Yes, tell the whole church. Let us say, we are here, we are God's living enterprise, and we are here to manifest prosperity. Together, we are God's living enterprise, and we are here to demonstrate prosperity. And my friends, that is the ongle truth. God bless you. <laughs>